Hello, everybody. This is Al. This is Al Metzger and uh, Matthias Beckers. Uh, good morning, uh, evening, afternoon. <laughs> uh, today, today we have we have a couple of uh, little subjects that we want to address, and uh, we've been talking, you know, preparing this uh, this this uh, this episode number seven of uh, Nuclear Unscripted and. Uh, there was this this really really cute new news that one of the Greenpeace executives flies twice a month from Luxembourg to Amsterdam to work. <laughs> you know, the, these Working are the, that carbon footprint. These are the same people who say nobody should be flying anymore. So. Yeah. I was a little bit flabbergasted, not not really flabbergasted. I mean, I I I I figured as much. So let's see. Uh, the costs are two hundred and fifty euros for a round trip, which are funded by Greenpeace. This and the fun- yeah, your donations at work. Yeah, uh, and the funny thing is, Greenpeace says, and they quote, and it, it this is, this comes from the Telegraph. Uh, they quote um, that aviation is ruining our chances of stopping dangerous climate change. So, so, <laughs> so, so it's do as I say, not as I do, right? For Greenpeace. Yep, that's uh, kind of what it is, right? And some of the <laughs> some of the volunteers are saying that they cannot fathom. Uh, fathom that he's doing it and um it, it, it's it's it, the article also says that each round trip generates 142 kilograms of carbon dioxide according to the airline that transports the guy and so far he would have been responsible for 7.4 metric tons of excess CO2. Now, 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 just to put it, in, put this into perspective, I, I, I believe this guy is from Luxembourg. I don't know. I, I don't think he's Dutch. But the average Dutch person has a carbon footprint of fifteen point four metric tons a year. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you add another seven point four, that's adding fifty percent almost. Slightly less. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's not to say that there aren't, you know, plenty of executives around or other people that travel like that, that uh, it's part of the jobs. That's what they do. Yeah. But you're not also the ones that are saying we have to stop doing this. Exactly. That's, that's the whole point. Listen, I am not necessarily opposed to air travel so much. You know, I really wish that we can make it more environmentally friendly. I mean, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and 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 I I do think that we should make a conscious effort to travel more by train or by car or bicycle or whatever is possible within the range. You know. The funny thing is, he said um, he would rather not take it. It would take him 12 hours Mm -hmm. to do the same trip by train, the round trip. So that's six hours each. Or how about if he like uses a video conference like this? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I've been I've been right now I've opened Google Maps and I, I basically planned uh planned the trip by car so if you do it by car it takes you about four hours to get from luxembourg to amsterdam so it's, you know it's doable it 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 takes mm-hmm. half a day so you have to plan it carefully but it's doable if i take the train which it is calculating right now i don't i, I don't know how it, it would probably he said oh sorry we could not calculate so he's probably right it's probably a hard thing to do by train well he, he could go from from luxembourg to brussels i think train luxembourg brussels uh 
And from Brussels, there's a high-speed train. I'm pretty sure of that. Let's see if there's a train from Luxembourg to Brussels. Oh, I'm, I'm very interested if, the, if that thing exists. All right. It is. Oh, but it takes eight hours. Hmm. Right. Oh, wait a second. I get it. That's a night train. Let's see what it does. If we go, we do it like that. I'm really going off script today, as you can see. <laughs> un <laughs> un unscripted today. Yes, um, as as normal. Okay, so it's a three-hour train drive. Three hours? It has to change one time in... Okay. So it's a... Wow. I would never guess that it would take two hours and 51 minutes to take that train. So yeah, okay. It's probably... If it's a three-hour trip from his place to Brussels... Then it's another add another one two hours from Brussels to Amsterdam. So, I guess planning around is the most efficient way to go in times of in terms of time. But still, <laughs> yeah, and and I mean, and it's uh, it's when you do that, you you do it more frequently. So you know, in other words, you make maybe you take two of those trips to get together and then come back in the same day, even. Yeah, you know, and uh, if you do that, then that's you know your your mileage, uh, you know, for per gallon of of liquid fuel is probably I, I don't think it's that bad uh -huh. on a plane, but but it's like you burn through it all very very quickly, right? Yeah. So if you don't do any traveling for the next three days, instead of you know instead of driving around like you might have or, or something else, then, you know, maybe, maybe that balances out and, and it's okay. But um, it's, you know, you really, it, it is complicated and it's also something that, uh, you know, I think you and I would say, like, like you were saying earlier, it's not something that we have to stop doing. No. And it's not realistic to think that we would stop doing it, but we really do need to address the issue. Yeah. And the issue is not different than it is with most of the rest of our transportation, which is exactly. it's all pretty dirty yeah. from it's, a CO2 it, perspective. Exactly. It's not necessarily the mode of transportation that is wrong. It's just the the way that we fuel it and, right. and, and, and the emissions so, that come from yep. it. So if, if, yeah, so this is why I'm so bullish on uh, on on sin fuels and absolutely. and doing that with uh, with uh, plentiful clean nuclear energy can yes can generate that stuff and you know we still have some you know some things that uh, that could be improved based on that because the CO2 that's generated at high altitudes is is worse than CO2 generated on the ground. Yeah, but, I believe I read something like that. Yeah, yeah but it's but it's uh you know but it it it's an improvement right and it could be a big improvement and it and it doesn't require just totally trashing our economy yeah which is essentially what would happen if we got rid of the airline industry as we know it that, that's what and, happens and, if you take and it it's, away it's simply not it's simply not you know feasible because yeah, just, because right. we are a global species now you know we have all of us we yes all, we are yeah all of us we have relationships that span continents or even cross oceans yeah like ours yeah and and i mean <laughs> for instance my grandma has one sister who lives in new zealand and they want to see each other once in a while aside from the mm -hmm. skype thing well they did right. want to see each other because my grandpa and my grandma is dead now unfortunately she she passed away a couple of years ago but when she still lived she wanted to travel to new zealand and her sister wanted to travel to holland you know once every two or three years just so they could hug each other and have a couple of days together so mm -hmm. that's not so strange and my wife's grandmother has has had the same thing her now deceased brother lived in toronto so they had to fly to Toronto every, 
you know, three or four years just to have, you know, some personal time together. And that's only going to happen if you take the plane. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you want to take a boat, that's possible, but it's going to take you at least three weeks to get over. Oh yeah, <laughs> awfully expensive too. <laughs> and it's awfully expensive. That's true. Awfully yes. Expensive. So, was, uh, so was, anyway, we we could work on that, and we could do a lot to fix it. But the things that we could do are things that Greenpeace doesn't want to do. So there you go. Yeah, it's it's that simple. It's that simple. They 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 have a forked tongue, or they are two faced, or you know, a hypocritical. You know. Yes, just be honest about what you're doing, and that's something they cannot do because that would basically show that they're fundamentally dishonest. And I and I, I I've never been a fan of Greenpeace to begin with. Just just think about you know. For instance, what they did to the Nazca lines, which is this, you know, cultural thing that has existed for, I don't know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of years over in Peru. And there's this beautiful yeah. picture of a hummingbird that, that, that some people made all those years ago. And just for the sake of publicity, they put, you know, this banner over not the hummingbird itself, but over parts of the, you know, the entire thing. And right now you can see that the banner has been there. Thus, they have basically desecrated or... Yeah, they defaced it, right? Defaced, yeah. So, so Greenpeace is, you know, they have some good ideas, you know, saving the whales. And, you know, I think that whales deserve protection. So that's a good thing, but you know I don't think that the the end justifies the means, and the means in this particular case is just being fundamentally dishonest. Yes, I agree. What else do we got? Um, you tell you told me an interesting fact that the American Nuclear Society. Uh, told told your told the members that even though the U.S. has now six reactors less than they had, you know, before a couple of years ago. So instead of having one hundred and four, now you have ninety eight. You still are creating mm-hmm. more energy from them than when you had the one hundred and four. Could you could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, essentially what, they, what they're what they talking about in this issue is the capacity factor of the nuclear fleet in the U.S. Um, and the capacity factor has been generally increasing um, pretty consistently. Um, and if you watch, you know, if you, if you look at the graphs, you can, you can see that it's generally an upward swing. It's kind of leveling out because you can't really get much higher than 100. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but, uh, but it's, you know, the, the fleet as a whole is, is, is over 90% now. And, um, you know, they have a list of a couple of different charts that show all the different units and uh, how good they're doing. But, you know, we've lost six uh reactors in the in the past few years um the so kiwani up here in uh, wisconsin the one that i always shed a tear when i drive by it uh-huh. <laughs> um san san onofre has two you know out of california two units that shut down yeah. uh, vermont yankee of course uh, fort calhoun in nebraska which was pretty small but it was still one of the two so those are the six yeah and then um oyster creek uh, also recently just uh shut down in uh, last september yeah. so yeah <clears throat> um so even though those all shut down the you know b- between capacity factor and some up rates that not, none of them most of them are not very big the up rates weren't but uh yeah but uh, although that reminds me of something else i wanted to mention um the total amount of energy um yeah, electricity terawatt hours that went up uh, as a result of that uh, increase in capacity factor, mm. even with fewer reactors, was um, 
it was 0.1 terawatt hour. So, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a, oh. it's a freaking terawatt hour, man. <laughs> you know, yeah. those things are, it's like, you know, a trillion, you know, watts for an hour. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's, that, I think it's pretty impressive. And it's, you know, and, and actually we, we produce quite a bit more than we did, you know, 20 years ago, maybe yeah. when we had like 130 reactors. I mean, put it on a banner. Cry, right. You know, put it on, put it on a, next to the freeway on a big you know uh advertisement mm -hmm. billboard and, and do it like a hundred times over in the entire yeah, u.s you would uh you would you would think it would uh it would make sense to do that the Eat uh that drum. The TVA, the tennessee valley authority which is a, a government agency that runs some reactors here they're uh they've got watts bar and they've also got brown's ferry and brown's ferry was at one point had a had a fire when they were shut down they were and they were constructing some things they had a fire that followed a bunch of the wiring around the insulation on the wiring was yeah and, and it was a pretty is a pretty pretty bad thing and cost yeah. a lot of money to remediate um as a really stupid reason that it started but it's um, probably but, it's probably you know budgetary <laughs> or not buying the the right grade of electricity wire. No, it was or... it was it was the guy was using his uh, cigarette lighter to see if he sealed up the uh, the hole right, and uh. Uh, and the stuff that he was sealing it with was flammable. So uh. anyway, <laughs> <laughs> now now we know, right? We don't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, those three units at that at that station just got upgraded, and they're just finishing up the third oh, one. Cool. And the total uprate in megawatt capacity is 450 right. it's like bigger than most power plants yeah. and it's just the uprate it's like a 14 percent uprate in in power they did it to all three units yeah and so if you look at that and you compare it you know it's, it costs cost them somewhere just south of 500 million dollars to do that yeah and you know you can't buy clean energy anywhere near that for you know, that much clean energy for anywhere near that price any other way yeah and uh so that's that's the kind of all thing that's also resulted in us having uh you know more energy from fewer reactors today that's that kind of thing has happened too the, fu so. the funny thing is that you it's like a big secret yeah you me you mentioned uprate and i just i just googled this and uh, because i knew from a friend of mine who works there peach bottom one of the oldest nuclear power plants in the U.S. has had an uprate as well. It's only 20 megawatts electric, but it's mm -hmm. still 20 megawatts electric. You know, it's... Well, and and most most reactors have, and it's, you know, it's it's this very careful thing. They have to, you know, design it carefully. It, it's got a... The license has to change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have to get licensed for the extra amount of energy that they uh, thermal energy that they want to produce yeah um and i'm just i'm making some noise here fl fluttering through my oh that's all right um we're not but, we're not uh, the best produced uh, program on the net <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's got uh i mean if you look at um you know some the, the some of the power operates recently that have been done uh you know they have two of well, four four of the eleven reactors here in, here in Illinois just just had that happen, and yeah. and yeah, Peach Bottom two and three are on here, yeah. um, and uh, they were uh, percentage wise one point uh, six six, yeah, Peach Bottom. Yeah, so it's uh, so it's you know we we consistently get more out of these things, and everybody says oh they're just they're aging. <sighs> aging is such a horrible term to use for that yeah. because it's exactly. it's like. The only thing that's the same is the RPV and the, and the concrete. Listen, I, mean, I, I know that people generally don't think about Han Solo as a dependable fictional person. I, I, you know who Han Solo is, right? Han so, Solo, uh, like, like... From Star Wars. From the, so, oh, right. Han, Han Solo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Han Solo, he flew this very old rinky-dink freighter and this, so a freighter is not like you know a a a a, a, fla a flashy thing, but he was so proud of that freighter that he kept tinkering with it and made it faster and more agile and you know so nobody gave two shits about his Millennium Falcon, 
but it was the ship that flew like a, like a jet fighter, for instance. And I just figure all these reactors in the U.S. must have like 10,000 Han Solos <laughs> walking around there. They're just passionate about the stuff they're working on. Uh, and this is a very big organization. I mean, the NRC and everybody has to sign off on what they're planning to do. And they make it happen. And they make their quasi-aging nuclear reactors perform mm -hmm. much better than they were ever intended to do. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly than they envisioned when they first uh, built them. Precisely. <laughs> right. So anyway, I you know I, I always try to you know latch on to you know good news like that because I need I need it. Absolutely, but we need we need to put it on billboards. Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, one of the things we were thinking about is uh, creating a side by side meme with the uh, with the TVA thing, and then you know put it next to a just to any other energy source and and put the you know per per terawatt hour you know price or something right I mean yeah. so even even by capacity put it up there and uh, you know apply the capacity factors and then compare them and put them right next to each other and show just how much different it is because it's very different yeah absolutely you want so much better you wanted to tell us something about the prism reactor so the prism is uh, basically um, it's a design that came directly out of the integrated fast react integral fast reactor mm -hmm. uh, work that was done in the U.S. at the Idaho National Labs, yeah, or Argonne West as it was called, in the EBR two, mm -hmm. which was kind of the pilot reactor for those concepts. It was integral in that it has all the fuel processing and reprocessing built into the actual plant. It uses metallic fuel. Yeah. So it's easy to reprocess, easier to mm -hmm. reprocess the uh, fuel. It's also a fast reactor, so it can burn um, all of the actinides and the things that are uh, that that you get from uh, regular, you know, our today's uh, water reactor. Right. Uh, you know the 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 fuel that comes out of those it can't be used anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it can actually use that to to burn energy or yeah. to make energy. So and so so just boil it down to almost nothing. Yeah, right? just for for clarity's sake, for those who are watching and might not know, but a fast reactor basically uses slightly more, or you know, some bigger amount of fissile material, which is uranium two thirty five generally, or plutonium two thirty nine, I believe, as mm -hmm. a starting load and the fissions that occur are then used so the neutrons that come from the fissions that occur initially are used to make new plutonium 239 from uranium 238 which is basically the stuff that we want to throw away yeah right <laughs> and, and and we want that we want and and, and the the ge hitachi because that's the guys who designed the prism reactor. Yes. Right? Basically, mm -hmm. they have made a design that makes you continuously transmute uranium-238 into plutonium-239 and then fission that. And All right. So there's, there is some breeding that, uh, that happens there. That's, that's right. It, exactly right. Um, there's also uh, the ability to take that used fuel uh -huh. that's got plutonium it's got actinides it's got uh, u238 in it right and basically use all of it to make energy because yeah. because it's high energy neutrons yeah you can split more of what's in there and uh, and yeah. and so instead of having this really hot stuff that lasts you know five thousand or ten thousand years or something like that mm -hmm. you can actually use that up yeah and be left with stuff that's uh, very low um Low, low persistence. Um, exactly. We'll get to the you know, background. And, and, and the beauty of it is, and some people, you know, they always tend to bash on us when they say, well, breeder reactors are like, you know, 20 years, 20 years ahead or 10 years ahead. We, we still need to wait on them and none are commercially available. <laughs> I mean, they I'm don't go ask the Russians. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the first thing. But the other thing is, and is it the EBR2 that they operated for 35 years? 
Yeah, yeah, it was a long, uh, long run. I yep. mean, they did it for thirty-five years. I mean, yeah, and they've been, you know, they've been kind of decommissioning that for you know years and years now. At, uh, yeah, well, uh, you see, there, there are some things that people say. You know, there's some legacy from the EBR two that is hard to manage, but. <sighs> I mean, we have a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. We know how to do it, and there's probably ways we can improve. So, certainly there are. Um, and uh, the thing is that the thing that always pops through my mind is uh, so here, you know, you a big, a, a big uh, concern point mm -hmm. for a lot of people is uh, what about the waste, right? What about the nuclear waste? Yeah. So we say, okay, answer. well, here's a here's a machine that can use it to create energy and get rid of it. Yeah, exactly. And then they say, well, wait a minute though, but you can't touch the, you can't reprocess the fuel because we don't want you to because of you know proliferation concerns or something. So, you know, it's moving the goalposts every yeah. time, yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. So. Uh, you know, you're, you have, have a machine an that could actually do the yeah. perfect thing, right? Yeah, we Create something an useful out of something that's waste. Exactly. Mm -hmm. but, and, and it was uh, it was Bill Clinton's administration that killed the EBR program. Yeah, it was. And I had, you know, I'm, I'm actually pretty sure there was no nefariousness there. I think it was just, uh, you know, we didn't have an energy crisis at the time. Uh -huh. um, and there were other budgetary things that were bigger priorities, and that's just how it happened. It's and you know, just like the nuclear industry, you know, there wasn't a lot of real popular support for that because nobody knew about it. Yeah, I mean, it was just stuff that they were doing out there, and they had great successes, but they didn't have a PR campaign. To it go was along with too it. arcane. It wasn't NASA. Yeah. And it was too arcane. They were doing it out in the desert somewhere in Idaho or I don't know. Is it desert? It's pretty yeah. arid, right? It's pretty arid. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, places that you wouldn't normally choose to live because it's just not very interesting. Yeah. Or, or, or you know. And it's some esoteric. Not very hospitable. <laughs> right. And it's some esoteric thing where people are doing arcane stuff that we don't understand. So why do we keep funding it? That's basically the gist of it. I yeah, think. which is where the communications people come in, right? I mean, you know, they put it in the uh, you know terms that people can you know appreciate and uh, get support for it based on that. But you gotta you gotta engage professionals to do that communications for you. Yeah. And if you don't do it, then it's just gonna be people like you and me. <laughs> you know, and we try, but we're nice mice nuts compared to you know, what we would do if you had a yeah. you know, a little bit of a budget. Right? Exactly. It's not like we're you know. <laughs> We're not just we, we wish we were paid shills, but we're not. We're just shills. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no money involved. No, no, no. Just look at all the wealth around me. I mean, so I think the prism is is a is a real sleeper. I, I do think that the, at some point it'll it'll uh, it'll get produced and and will benefit from it. Hmm. Um, there's also something called uh, a company called Arc, which has a similar. Um, unit that's, um, you know, and I'm not sure where they are with in terms of how far away they might be to commercialization, but they keep working on it. That's the and thing. they, you know, there's keep uh, working on options. Don't throw options away. And so they they keep working through it. Just it takes a long time for that stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, but once we get something that you can build in a factory, and I think New Scale is probably going to be there first. But oh, but, uh, sure. But and that's like the least that you know the, the least deviated from today's designs, right? I mean, it's it's mostly the same kind of fuel, the same solid fuel, same water moderator, and everything. But it's a it's a it's a redesigned um, size, and it's a redesigned um, way of of uh, of taking the heat, you know, managing the heat so that it can be walk away safe. And, exactly. uh, and those are pretty huge things because now you can build it like you build airplanes. Yeah. And you can go and, you know, you could just put one of them at a side or 12 of them at a side. And, exactly. and they actually already have almost a, a customers. I think they have a customer. I mean, I just, you know, that's still probably, you know, until it's actually there, it's hard to say, but, but, uh, but the UMS folks uh, are planning to use it. Oh, and I just um, and I just read it. This is pretty fresh off the press. Yeah, and it has some other interest too. Yeah, yeah. and they are considering the uh, they are considering to work with metallic fuel as well. So that is inter interesting. Oh, let's see. 
uh, where did, because it said something about when they were planning on starting the first Fraviton 12. Let's see, where is it? Uh, 20-ish. Because this is pretty, this is just, you know, eight days old, seven days old. Well, pretty new. Yeah. Oh, the review is the review of the technology is scheduled for completion in this September 2020. A demonstration new scale small modular reactor is projected to be operational by 2024. Yes. So that's, that's pretty what I've quick. heard as well. Yeah, that's pretty quick. That's five years from now. Yeah, that's uh, sooner than you think. As, as sooner than I not not as soon as I would like it to be, mm-hmm. <laughs> but but uh, oh. it it'll be here before you know it, and you exactly. know within my lifetime, which I'm happy about. Yeah, you know, because a lot of the stuff we talk about is a great idea be within my lifetime. So absolutely. So All I right. I want to I wanted to wrap this up with just an announcement. I I, I was tinkering with my Excel sheet on. Uh, on screen already so what what i'm doing right now and this is this might be interesting I, I i told you that i was working on a thing that wasn't a thing yet and you know i was <laughs> i was right. looking, looking at where it would take me and while the thing is starting to become an article and i didn't realize that it would become an article but at, at this moment what i have done is i have basically determined what the, the the low and the high ranges of dutch emissions are for gas and coal and they are basically be, between 18 megatons or basically between um 39 megatons and about uh 80 almost 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 90 megatons per year i have determined how much energy so that's for the whole country yeah that's for the whole country okay uh, right. our total emissions are 193 megatons but that's just from domestic energy production and usage and you know gas usage and such but our mm-hmm. total carbon footprint so this is also you know importing goods and such is 260 to 270 megatons a year so that's pretty beefy for a small country and uh, i've established you know five designs the epr the eswr the apr 1400 the abwr and the ap 1000 and i basically extrapolated how much energy each of them is going to produce or basically five units of them are going to produce mm-hmm. and how much annual equivalent CO2 emissions you would get, you know, but that's from mainly from fuel production materials and such. I've, I've set it at a pretty, pretty high 15 grams per CO2. But but just to have you know something to offset. But it turns out uh, right now, let's see the offset model. So I've built an offset model, and it turns out that if you you know we consider it, consider the Dutch total emissions from 190 megatons a year, that if you built five units, five EPRs, you would be able to reduce. 19 to 26 percent of those emissions that's Hmm. pretty good that's pretty good because that's because it's almost all electricity what you're doing and and these emissions you know they are much bigger than just electricity because there's also transportation in here and heating and yeah, it just takes up a huge chunk out of your electricity, and and as a result, it actually shows up on the map. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. So that's that's pretty good, but it's it even gets better if you manage to convince these people to build ten units, because if you build ten units, you can, and, and so the low percentage remains the same, and that's because of the low. Uh, production figures for coal and gas if you take the lowest capacity factors right uh-huh so the range right, yeah yeah so the range in in percentages when you build 10 is 20 to 60 to 46 percent 
So that's almost half in the so almost half of the wow. Dutch emissions. So you go down from 190 to 153 or from 200 to 108. So and it's not like you couldn't just you know couldn't build those pretty pretty quickly if you decided to just do it. Oh yes, the EP the EPR can be built within 10 years. Tai Shan, yeah. mm-hmm. Tai Shan 1 and 2. Tai Shan 1 is mm-hmm. finished and operational and it took them 8 years to build it. Yeah, we just everybody says too long, too expensive, and it's like, well, it's because they're not working at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you and I just I just look at Baraka, which is the yeah, EP, right. EPR fourteen hundred that they are building in the United Arab Emirates, and they built them within six years, six to eight years. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things went right there, but uh, that just shows that it's not an inherent. To nuclear kind of a problem. No, oh, exactly. It just means that you have to be, uh, you know, I mean, you you have to be willing to allocate the right resources and yeah. to and, and, and here's to have the thing. some experience doing it. If you order ten of these and you stagger them, you know, build two in the first yeah. year and two in the next year and two in the next year mm-hmm. and two in the next year, I bet you you can get a you can get a bombing learning curve out of this out of that i i i would hatch my bets that your last unit would be 10 15 30 you know perhaps even 20 percent cheaper I, yeah i do think it would be uh it would be an improvement yeah no doubt about it but that's uh, uh, that, that's what i'm working on right now it's still a thing i know what it is but i don't know if i'm you know, if, if the quality is there, but I keep working on it. And once I've got a first initial finished project pro- product, I will share it with some of the academics from our uh, from our world and see if they have any recommendations on what to do differently and to improve some stuff. And so that's what I that, that's what I wanted to know. Do you have anything else to you want to add? Um, nope, I think I'm good for now. Yeah. So, so yeah. well, that, that, that pretty much wraps it up for today. So uh, thank you all for watching. This was Matthias Backers. This is Alan Metzger. And uh, this is uh, Nuclear Unscripted at the Nuclear Humanist. Bye-bye. <laughs>